What is it about risk, Ben, that defines what it means to be Ben jealous? You know, look, I think what I became good at is actually judging risk. And politics, especially when you're an organizer and you're right on the cutting edge of the issue, and investing is fundamentally about being able to judge risk. Uh, when we um, would plan a campaign at the association, we were by our very nature taking on tough issues. But when you're the CEO, you have to know that that's an issue that's both worth taking on and you have a good chance of winning because your membership won't tolerate you losing repeatedly. You know, but they will grow if you win repeatedly. And so you, you, know, you have kind of multiple calculations that you're making, multiple risks that you're taking when you just you even get into one issue. But and it's the same right now in the Silicon Valley. I mean, we, you know, we look at, we probably invest in, I don't know, one, two, three percent of the startups that, that, that we see each year. And each time, you know, you're saying no, you're taking risks because you may embarrass yourself. That, that, that be, may be the next Facebook. And each time that you actually decide we're putting in our money and our time, well, you're taking you know, risk right there with the entrepreneur. But it's just something that comes upon you. I mean, the difference between people like yourself willing to take risks and those that don't, what's the difference? Well, I mean, I think why people take risks and being willing to take risks fundamentally, um, you know, I talked about that. It has to do, I think, with your experience with, with, with risk when you're, when you're young. You know, when I was a kid, I um, you know, took a, uh, one of my first risks was deciding to go off of my anti-seizure medication when I was like seven or eight years old. Um, knowing that I could die if I did it, but knowing that the life I would have lived was not one that I wanted to live, and so at a very young age, deciding to do that and profiting from it, being able to ride a bike for the first time, um, and that kind of gave me a charge. You know, later on when I was a kid, it was, it was, it was riding really big waves. Uh, these were waves that you know, can and do kill people, um, but you survive and you get a charge, and then you and then you decide at some point. You know, maybe uh, you, you know, you've just figured something out. You're just a little bit better at kind of judging the next wave, judging the next big risk. So Ben, is one of the big issues today in America channeling risk? Uh, in our last Futurecast, we had Tina Selig, who's a professor of, uh, at Stanford University, and she's written a book about creativity. And in that book, she argues that there's not a great deal of difference between the Zuckerbergs and the Elon Musks, the risk takers in entrepreneurship from the risk takers in the ghettos who end up in high security jails. Do you think that's fair? And is our challenge, challenge uh, channeling risk, figuring out how the people who take risks against the law need to redirect that and, and, and focus on creativity and contributing uh, to a broader economic progress? You know, look, fundamentally, we're a country that was made great because people were willing to take risk, right? You get back, back to the American Revolution, you look at the uh, you know, leaps in I innovation, and again and again, the people that we really see as heroes in our country are great risk takers. Um, I think there's a real point that there's a lot of great minds in our prisons um, who, if given up other opportunities, could be doing great things. I mean, we have a company in our portfolio who's actually an entrepreneur in the book, a guy named Frederick Hudson, founded a company called Pigeon League. Excellent chapter. Yeah, man. no, and you know, I mean, Frederick, when he came out of Y Combinator the other night, Y Combinator is sort of like the Harvard of accelerators, right? Um, you and I know this, but for the broader audience. And it, it's a big deal if your company's accepted and, and you come out there on pitch day. And one of the first things he said as he was introducing himself, he was talking about you know, how he had purchased a UPS store in his early 20s for the purpose of distributing marijuana. Right? He said, you know, and I said, I sold a lot of pot. I said, I sold a lot of pot. I mean, when you purchase a, 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 a UPS store to distribute your pot, you're selling <laughs> a lot of pot. And where right? was he? Where uh, was he? I right? believe he was in, in Florida, as I recall. Right. And, so he uh, was a natural entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, he was somebody who thought big. And when the SWAT team showed up, he didn't even run. He knew why they were there and who they were there for. And when he went to prison, he told himself that he would write a business plan every day. And he was only in prison for four years, but that was enough time to write more than 1,000 business plans. And when he came out of federal prison and, uh, and they said at the halfway house, you're not allowed to make phone calls, he got a cell phone from somebody and he hid on his bunk and he started calling investors. 
His company, Pigeon Leap, has cut the cost of calling home from prison by more than 90% for people in the federal system, made it much more affordable for fathers to stay in touch with children, for mothers to stay in touch with children. Uh, it was fundamentally about, you know, really kind of three things, right? One, um, you know, him having some basic preparation in business, some of which he got from the street, some of which he got kind of more tra tra traditional means. Two, having a really big uh, idea, and three, having an itch he just had to, to, to scratch. And that's, you know, that's what we're kind of focused on at Caper Capital. Half of our investors come, you know, are, excuse me, half of our companies are founded by blacks, Latinos, and women. Um, our portfolio perf performs extremely well. A company like Pigeonly, it, uh, its revenues increase about 60% a quarter. Right? Its growth is about 60% a quarter. And, um, and it's exactly because our door is, is open wider. Because we say, look, you know, we don't care at the end of the day uh, where you come from. We care about the quality of your idea. Most importantly, we want to know that you're scratching an itch that a lot of people have. And you know, when you, whether it's the 60 million unbanked people in our society or the millions upon millions of a family member in prison, there's a lot of big itches in this country that are going unscratched.